Okay, I'd like to have, welcome everyone to the ATD Pennsylvania Executive Education Series. As you all know, we present these sessions the second Wednesday of every month from 6 to 7 p.m. Tonight, we are very fortunate to have uh, Dr. Meredith Priscilli Lamel. She is the uh, professional lecturer, Department of Public Administration and Policy at American University. She's also the CEO of Aspire at Work and author of Six Paths to Leadership, which is uh, being published here this coming month. Um, so without further ado, Dr. Priscilla Lamel, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Um, I'm not a doctor, I am a professor, but I appreciate the promotion there. <laughs> um, thank you so much for inviting me to be here today to talk about our upcoming book. Um, this is a book that um, my co-author Mark Clark and I have been working on for many years and we're very excited to be near the finish line and have this invitation and opportunity to, to speak with all of you who are really uh, a major target for um, the work that we've done. And um, I do hope that this will be an interactive conversation. Um, thank you, Zachary, for um, for manning the, um, the Q&A and chat, please interrupt me as needed. And um, hopefully we'll have plenty of time at the end to have Q&A and any other conversation that you all would find helpful. Um, I did um, just create a couple of slides on, on my background. And I think, you know, the main thing that I wanted to share here is really, you know, I am in the neighboring geography, right? Just outside of Washington, DC. and um, and you know, the important thing here is that um, both Mark and I, um, based in DC, we are at that intersection of the public and the private sector, um, but both being you know, faculty, I come from an MBA background, um, I taught in the business school, Mark currently teaches in the business school, um, he's a full-time full professor in the business school. You know, we really look to bringing um, private sector practices into, into government. And we see um, these various contexts. So I do quite a lot of work with the legislative branch here in DC um, and also teach in a program out of the School of Public Administration. It's a leadership program for um, professionals in the executive branch. Um, and then, you know, again, with a real private sector background and many clients in the private sector, um, always looking to stay cutting edge on, on leadership. <laughs> Mark, my co-author, um, is a um, professor at, um, like I said, at COGOD. Um, and, um, and, you know, we really share these, share the passion around leadership um, and the desire to support leaders across multiple sectors. And um, so that's how we, you know, we came together to, to work on this book. And, um, and so as, um, you know, I've already, we've mentioned Six Path to Leadership. I know that you've seen a little bit about, um, about the book and the promo for today. Um, but I wanted to share with you a little bit about, you know, why we thought that writing this book was so important. And again, this goes back to, um, oh, my notes are showing. Interesting. So you're seeing the you're seeing the full notes. Okay, let me swap displays right now. <laughs> Is that better? So now are you just seeing the slides? No, we're seeing the notes as well. You are. Hmm. Okay. I'm sorry. That's what I was testing before. I thought we were we were fine there. Okay. Let me let me go. Pay no attention to the man behind the curtain, right? <laughs> yeah. Wow. Okay. Thank you, Mark, for, for being here and letting me know that. I thought we, we tested everything ahead of time and I thought we were just seeing the slides. Um, okay. okay. So now we're just seeing the slides, but of course now I don't see my notes. Yep. Is that good? Okay. All right. Well, let me, let me hope that I remember everything from, um, <laughs> from memory then on my notes. Okay. Um, so, so I want to let me go back to um, to why um, why we wrote this book. So uh, I talked a little bit already about how um, how we work across the the public and the private sector, and um, and and one of the things that became very um, um, very real in working across these sectors is that a lot of the literature about leadership. 
um, was very focused, particularly on the corporate environment. And for the most part, it would focus on, you know, leaders who were, you know, promoted from within a company or hired from the outside in terms of paths. And we'll talk a little bit more about path. Um, but it, it focused a lot on, you know, whether it was onboarding or leadership competencies, um, very little attention was, was made to how the different individuals got into their leadership positions, except with, with the exception of, um, of that promoted or hired from the outside um, idea. And in my work in particular um, with some of the public sector leaders that I was working with, I felt like that literature didn't really speak to some critical differences um, that um, that they were experiencing. And so, you know, this idea that you can just kind of take a book and look at leadership development and apply it to people in all different contexts um, really did not resonate. And so, which brings it to the next piece, right? That this context piece really matters. Now, um, when we think about context, that context is often either um, simply the, um, the industry, right? So we'll, we'll talk about leadership context in the, in, in, in the context of industry, right? Whether it's you know, the energy sector or education sector. Um, and then the other way that context is often talked about is around, um, um, is around the stage of growth that a company is. Is it a you know, small company, mid-sized company, high growth company? And once again, didn't really focus on um, this idea of paths. And what became, again, very clear um, in working with leaders across sectors and in cross contexts was that for each of these different leaders, there were some really important opportunities and challenges um, that were not about industry. They weren't about public or private sector. What they were instead was, um, was were themes around opportunities and challenges that apply to the path to entry, or in other words, the path on how that person came into the leadership position, right? So this was really the inspiration is, is you know, recognizing that the, the work about leadership that was out there and particularly around onboarding of leaders didn't reflect the many distinct challenges across, um, across different paths. So I've been using this term path, um, Um, quite a bit. And now I want to make sure that you all understand how Mark and I defined path. Okay. So I mentioned six different paths into leadership, and these are the six different paths that we explored. So the promoted path, which we're calling the insider, the outside hire, which we call the outsider, the elected path, which is the representative, the appointed path, and these are both appointees, um, both political appointees as well as appointees um, into onto boards of directors. We're calling that the proxy. Then there are the founders. So hopefully many of you work for companies where the founder is still, is still there. We are calling that leader the creator. And then finally, the sixth path, which is um, the family legacy path. In other words, somebody who takes a leadership position as a result of being, or is, is a candidate for a leadership position as a result of being part of the um, founding family or the owning family of an organization. So um, we, uh, again, we identified these six paths through our work um, and through our own academic study and felt like each of these paths really required additional exploration. And that regardless of what type of leader you are, whether you're, you know, you, um, um, again, regardless of industry, regardless of sector, um, and even, you know, certain personality traits of yourself, um, these different distinctions around how you got into your position, were you promoted from the inside? Were you elected by a group of constituencies? Were you the founder who then rose, um, who stayed leader as the company grew? 
Um, that path has um, many commonalities um, and that those commonalities were um, critical to study and how those commonalities in one path were distinct from some of those other paths. And when we're talking about leadership positions, we're talking about um, many of the different um, titles that are there on the right hand side of your page, right? It's a C-suite in corporations, it might be the governor or um, a mayor in the context of, um, of the elected, um, might be a secretary or an ambassador in the context of appointed leadership. So um, when we went out to research, um, we, um, we looked at, a, you know, we took a real academic approach to, um, to this research. We wanted to make sure that, um, that these paths really had legs, right? And that there weren't any paths that we were missing. Um, we did something called a Q-sort validation with, um, with a number of different groups where we basically um, identified the, what we believe to be the different traits of the distinct paths and then to see how, um, the, um, how the participants would then sort those traits across those six paths. Um, we then had you know, focus group conversations around whether or not there were any paths that we were missing. Um, there were only two paths that we even considered. Um, one was, do we want to separate the appointed path into two, those board appointees from political appointees? And we, we, we felt like there were actually enough commonalities that we would put those along one path. And then there was the other, another path, which is sort of the purchased path, which is when you buy a company and then you therefore assume leadership. Um, but we felt like regardless how that ownership may have moved, that leadership position was still going to be someone who was brought in from the outside or promoted from within, so matched one of the other paths. Um, we did over 65 interviews, um, hour-long interviews, we recorded them, and then we used Envivo, um, which I know one of your colleagues, I was talking with her before, is, is learning, um, but that helps to pull out the themes and again address those commonalities. We thought a lot about the audiences that we felt weren't being served by the literature and we wanted to make sure that we um, focused in on specific questions that would be helpful to different audiences and um, I'm sure you all see yourselves in, in um, a number of these places. So, you know, first for academics and students of leadership, um, we wanted to contribute um, um, to the research, um, to the literature, both in terms of how these paths um, both enable and constrain leaders around their performance, as well as identifying strategies and writing about strategies that would be helpful um, for leaders across the different paths. For coaches, HR partners, and consultants, we wanted to bring greater awareness for them in supporting their partners, their leader, leader partners. Um, you know, what awareness can they have themselves that they can then bring to their clients? Um, and then also what resources and tools would be helpful to them in onboarding these leaders into, um, you know, uh, onboarding these leaders towards success. And then finally, we were thinking about, you know, the students of leadership who are more focused on their own career development. And we thought it was really important for them to understand not only what are those future paths for them, but also to ask the questions for themselves around where they might prefer to pursue a path and what might work best for their strengths and challenges. Um, we actually developed a tool, we call it a SWOC analysis, which looks at your strengths and weaknesses against the oppor opportunities and challenges of each of the different paths. So that context, really understanding that context, and then as an individual thinking about, you know, which of these paths might be um, more supportive um, for you or where you might be better set up for success. So before I go into the first path, I'll just stop here and see if there are any questions um, Zachary, are there any questions about just sort of the setup, um, why we um, why we wrote this book, um, and um, you know, just at the high level? Um, so I just have one in here. It says, um, "Did you find that any of these leadership paths were dependent on the other to actually fall in that range?" So, for example, 
a successful mayor maybe had to demonstrate leadership in a different pathway before they could, you know, achieve some sort of appointment or some sort of um, elected place. So was there was leadership depend some of those pathways dependent on previous leadership experience in a different path? Yeah. So we didn't look at selection, right? So um, we didn't, you know, that would be a very extensive study. You know, we would need a much larger sample size to um, to validate research on on you know what were the requirements in order to be selected in one path or another. Um, what I will say is that the theme that you're talking about, which is how your previous experience is or is not leveraged, does vary by path, and so your past experiences, your reputation, the skills you've developed, um, the things that are working in your advantage and disadvantage are gonna be different depending on the path that you take. Um, and so, you know, the exact same experiences, past experiences may show up as an opportunity in one path and a challenge in another path. And I'll just give you one example. We, um, in looking at the, um, and we'll, I'll talk about this a little more in the outsider path, but the many times when someone is coming in from the outside, it's usually because they are bringing skills or experience from the outside that does not exist inside of a company, right? I'm sure you all are very familiar with that concept. Um, one of the things that we found in our research was that, you know, so many times that person might come from the competition, right? That experience is both an opportunity and a challenge for the outsider, right? Because on the one hand, they have that credibility from coming from the outside with that experience. And that's a credibility, they usually have that credibility that they wanna leverage further. But on the other hand, it's often a threat around trust, right? And how they manage um, that potential lack of trust having come from a competitor mm -hmm. is going to be um, something that they're gonna to wanna to proactively manage um, coming in from the outside. There's actually a couple more here. In your research, were you able to distinguish between um, managers and leaders? Then also just, um, you know, in terms of context and situation, had COVID added another layer to the way um, you approach this research and, and what effect did it have? Yeah, great questions. Um, so in terms of manager versus leader, and funny enough, the course I teach is transforming from manager to leader. <laughs> so I'm very familiar with those distinctions. Um, we really were looking at leadership positions. And so they did have to have, you know, a larger kind of scale um, in terms of, you know, they're, they're, you know, a manager of one would not have been someone who would have been part of our sample. And it wasn't the kind of the level of the organization that we were looking at in terms of the distinct paths, because again, we're trying to compare across, um, you know, the senior most in each of the different paths. Um, and so we really were focused more on, on leadership um, and those leadership qualities, even though, you know, some of the opportunities and challenges may, um, may, may have some management, you know, capabilities or skills as part of them. In terms of COVID, we finished our research before COVID. Um, so while we did do our writing during COVID, um, the research was complete. So, um, we did not take a big um, um, a big point of view around that. Um, we did certainly look at some of the challenges around remote leadership and some of the things that come up there and also cultural assimilation. Um, but it's certainly, um, it's a great idea for an article, right? How do we take the six paths and think about it in the context of COVID? That's, uh, that's the questions we have for now. Okay. Well, let's go into the insider again. This is um, probably the most well-known path, right? This is the path around being promoted from within um, an organization. And 
you know, um, we do hope you buy the book. So I'm not going to be giving away everything to you um, in this in this presentation. But um, you know, here is a selection of opportunities and challenges, and that's what I'll be doing for each of the different paths. And um, and and so you understand for um, in the book itself we identify the main opportunities and the main challenges for each of the different paths. And then we share strategies, um, you know, from the stories, you know, through stories of leaders on how they leverage these opportunities and how they managed um, some of these challenges. And so as you look at the insider path, certainly some of the key opportunities or advantages, right, is the cultural awareness, right? They've already been assimilated into the culture the relationship networks internal to the organization, and they have that proven track record, right? The reason why they've gotten ahead is they have that, you know, reputational record of what they've already been able to accomplish. Um, pretty much across the board for that promoted, um, something you all have probably heard about, that, that challenge of managing former peers, especially when those peers were also hoping to get the position that you, um, that this leader achieved. Um, shifting perceptions, right? So part of that proven track record um, is that you have the reputation. And so when you, if you want to shift a perception about yourself or if the job actually requires you to, um, that can be very difficult given, you know, that um, reputation you've already built. And then finally, how do you adapt habits to your new role, right? You're used to coming in in one role, um, how do you then adapt those habits to, um, to a new role? Um, um, a really critical part of, um, you know, kind of the, the what got you here won't get you there concept of, of um, promotion. So um, here we're going to turn to Gordy Bannister. And I think, you know, this idea around reputation is really, um, you know, the two sides of the coin of the insider path. So I wanted to focus this. And again, we're going to have, we have about, you know, you know, anywhere from seven to 10 leaders that we profile in each of the different um, paths. And Gordy is, has an incredible, incredible background of multiple positions in the energy sector, including um, this, at the CEO level, the large energy company. Um, and then now he serves on multiple boards. And so he actually appears in our appointed chapter as well um, in our proxy chapter. Um, but as he puts it so eloquently, um, when you are promoted from within, your strength is your reputation and your weakness is your reputation. The people who you know and know you can both help you and hurt you. Um, and so you can imagine um, when it comes to the insider, um, we um, provide strategies on how to proactively manage that reputation that's already been built and how you want to think about that reputational management um, um, as you transition. Jack Potter, um, so here, you know, comes from the, the government sector, but again, also um, the insider path and he's, um, he's currently CEO of the Metropolitan um, Metropolitan Washington Airport Authority, and he was a former um, postmaster general. And at the Postal Service, um, he was promoted from within. Um, and, um, and, and he has this real historical background because his father also worked um, for the Postal Service. And so what he shares, um, sorry, what he shares, um, here, my father also worked for the Postal Service and he gave me very useful advice. First, you have to maintain your integrity at all times. Second, let performance drive you rather than trying to align yourself with others. His third lesson was the people who advance were the ones who embrace change. The world is always changing around you. And if you're not part of the change process or in the advancement of the institution to a higher level, then you're just one of the masses holding it back. Um, we profile Jack um, for many reasons, and again, also in multiple chapters because of his robust um, career. But what um, what we're really trying to get at here is some of the is how do you manage that challenge around um, instituting change when you are one of the insiders? Um, you know, in many ways, when you are that insider, you have to challenge ideas that were put into place while you were there, and often by people you worked for. Um, and so, you know, how do you think differently and shift your habits around change so that you can also be someone 
who promotes change in your, in your organization. So for each of the different chapters, um, we encourage leaders to um, reflect on some of the areas where they may be most challenged and where they should be enhancing their awareness, right? Again, so much of this book is about enhancing your awareness around your context, around your path, um, and how those two things intersect. So for example, um, where is your base of support, right? Are you relying on your past relationships too much? Um, and how, where should you be growing your, those relationships or those bases of support? Um, how are you going to relate um, you know, to former peers, to subordinates, to superiors? Um, we have many stories about how those relationships had to be renegotiated. Um, what do you need to do differently? So this is that habits piece um, in, the, in, this, in this new position. And then finally, where might your perspective be limited and where might it need to grow? Um, you know, that one of the challenges of that insider path is that you don't have that outside point of view. And so coming to terms with those limitations of your perspective and then developing goals around how you might want to advance it. So that's um, some of the highlights of the insider path. Um, again, you know, we have lots more in terms of strategies that we outline and really give you kind of a roadmap for each of these different paths. The next path is the outsider path or hired from the outside. And here you see again, um, a selection of opportunities and challenges. And so, you know, certainly one of the advantages is that you bring in that new perspective and expertise um, because any outside hire is going to have some kind of a competition around it, there's often a perception that it was more earned, right, through a competitive process. Um, most of the time, people from the outside or many, much of the time, they are um, brought in because of this different perspective or, an, uh, you know, at the, at the senior most level, because there is a desire for change. And so that willingness to take risks um, both for yourself as well as for your context is often there. But then there are a number of different challenges, um, right? How do you assimilate to the culture? That piece that I was talking about before, if you identify with that former brand that could affect trust um, with your new colleagues. And then finally, that you're really in that fishbowl um, being um, you know, viewed um, every step of the way, how are you gonna approach that new job? And so um, we bring in an example from John Lair, who's CEO of the Parkinson's Foundation. And, and um, you know, what he, he, when he talked about how he was selected um, into that role, um, you know, they were looking for something very specific, which was, you know, someone who had worked with a, a foundation around a disease, but specifically um, a leader who had worked with, um, with a merger in the past. And he had that experience. And, what he found was that he had that that experience um, and how he used it, um, you know, could really be a great advantage. Um, so, in particular, you know, this idea of um, you know for him bringing in the expertise around um, around mergers and acquisitions, leveraging that meant not having an allegiance to um, either of the former organizations that had merged. Um, and so he used that to his benefit to win over the team to come in as that neutral, um, as that neutral leader. We then had the story of Stephanie Davis of the Volkswagen Group of, of America. And you know, I'm bringing this one in because of this cultural assimilation idea. Um, love this quote, right? I've been someone my whole life who kind of gets called out for being direct and so much to the point. We kind of make jokes that that's the reason the Germans love me and the reason that Americans think I'm a jerk. Um, she obviously um, brought in a great sense of humor as she told us this story. Um, but when she, you know, when she was coming in, um, you know, how, um, you know, she was, she came in as a new position. So they created this position. So she was coming in with a new um, set of expertise, um, but also, you know, culturally um, as an American woman um, working for um, a German auto company. Um, and so how she was able to um, uh, culturally assimilate and also um, earn that acceptance of the new position and that new skill set. 
so for the outsider, again, we have a number of different questions. Um, you know, one is um, really to reflect on what that, you know, you're brought in so much for your outside ideas, it's important to think about what the, your new organization does well. Um, and then to think about, you know, what your strengths are and how those might add value to your new organization. Um, develop a learning plan around that culture. And then also, um, you know, how might you test and spread that message in order to initiate change in an effective way. So again, these are just questions that um, are, are helpful as you think about you know, the opportunities and challenges of that path and which of the strategies you might want to best leverage in order to, um, to manage those more intentionally. So let me stop here after these first two paths, see if there are any questions so far before I go into the next one. Yeah, the one here is how much uh, of a theme would you say was leveraging um, your knowledge of sort of organizational politics in regards to the insider path? Did you feel like that was something that was pretty prevalent among the folks you spoke with in your research? Yes. Yeah, so, you know, the relationships and networks is a theme that cross across, that crosses all of the different paths. And again, you know, how it shows up as an opportunity or a challenge is different with the different paths, right? So, um, you know, when you're promoted from within, what you just said, right? You have those understanding of some of those internal politics where the um, centers of power might be, um, and that's really helpful. When you're an external hire, right? You have the external networks, right? And how do you leverage those to benefit? And one of the key strategies there that we shared was around, um, you know, helping people. So, you know, it's great that you have all these external connections, but if you don't share them with your new organization, they lose value. And so how do you, you know, make those introductions, um, help to create those connections so that it's brought in as a positive. Um, and then, you know, going across, right? We have other, um, you know, relationship um, issues for the other paths as well. I'll get into a few of them, but certainly, you know, how in the appointed path, um, the access to the principal and how you use that um, as an advantage. For founders, how you renegotiate the relationships, um, you know, personal and professional of the people who helped found the organization. Um, and then of course the family legacy path where all of these relationships are so complex and multi-layered um, and require a tremendous amount of um, TLC because the, um, the risks are so much higher when it comes to family and um, and how you're managing those relationships. So you know, again, it's um, it's a great question because you know, even how it's framed, it might apply to one path more than the other. And so, what we want to do is kind of expand it out and think about um, you know how we want to think about networks and relationships distinctly for each of the different paths. And so um, does your book make any recommendations for individuals who are in new leadership roles, for example, in their first 100 days, uh, regardless of their path? And the second question here is pretty interesting. You know, for someone who's a senior in a senior leadership role um, that are skilled at um, sort of behaving and communicating, um, does it change as you speak to those senior leaders that are above you? versus the people that you're managing below you? Or is that, um, is it more, con is it supposed to be consistent regardless of, you know, up or down? Okay. Yeah, so um, there are certain kind of tools that we, um, we certainly recommended for more than one path. Um, but again, you know, what our goal was, was to show that there should be a different approach depending on the path. So for example, you know, learning plans are great. When you go into a new position, you should have a learning plan, which is different from a development plan. Learning is really about the knowledge, right? That you need to develop. Um, what is in, what you need to learn um, for a promotion from within is gonna be very different from when you are coming in from the outside. Um, or you know, certainly elected leadership and some of these other paths. And so um, again, the themes are consistent, but then um, we recommend you know, 
a tweak or um, um, a different approach depending on the path. And that's, you know, that's exactly what we were trying to do for our readers because you may have been used to a certain strategy or a tool um, that worked for you really well in one path, but then when you transition to a new path, you have to think a little bit differently about how to go how to go about it, right? Your listening tours, listening tours is a standard practice um, for that first 90 days, but how you conduct yourself in that listening tour should be different depending on that path. Um, and then your other question was around, you know, how you kind of manage up versus down. Yeah, so like, they, for example, um, they should, you know, my, for, if your board is sort of driving hard and tough, sort of fear-based leadership style, you know, would it be appropriate to act one way with them to get results, but um, then be a quote-unquote um, real leader to those who I'm managing below me? Yeah, I mean, again, that, um, what we were focused on for this book, because there are so many, there's so many great books about, you know, how do you lead and manage effectively in different, you know, for different purposes, whether it's to motivate or, you know, guide performance management or execution. There's lots of literature about, you know, some of those standard management skills. Um, and we wanted to do something different, something that hadn't been done yet that we felt there was a need for. Um, what I would say is that we would want you to think a little bit differently about kind of what does it mean to manage up versus managing down depending on the path. And so just as an example, and we're gonna get to the elected leaders in a moment, right? their stakeholders are very different than the stakeholder of a CFO of a corporation. Um, and the CFO of a corporation, a publicly traded corporation is gonna be different than a family member who's a CFO of a family business. Um, you know, who your stakeholders are, are they the family members who own the business? Are they the shareholders? Um, are they leadership of your political party? Um, are they the different constituencies? And so, you know, these different paths have a very different stakeholder map um, that is um, consistent within the path, even across different leaders. Um, and we want to encourage you to understand those differences so that you think about how to lead effectively in that context a little bit differently. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Okay. Um, so, yeah, we already, um, I'm going to try to get through the next ones pretty quickly. Um, so the next one was, um, is the representative. So um, this is, um, you know, somebody who is elected into their position. So mayors, governors, members of Congress, senators, we interviewed um, many different um, elected leaders. And again, quite a few differences from other paths. First of all, the leader, him or herself is the entity as opposed to a product. They have that power to convene groups just through their positional power. Um, and they have exceptional talent available who want to be, you know, part of that kind of power center. Um, on the challenges side, there's term limits, there's fixed terms, um, there's very high constituent expectations that don't necessarily align with the power that, that elected leaders have. Um, and certainly the, um, the visibility, the schedule and family toll can take a quite a bit of toll personally for individuals. Um, we highlighted, you know, again, many, um, many elected leaders. Connie Morello is one of our favorite interviews for sure, um, as um, a former ambassador um, and a former member of Congress. And she was someone who was a um, Republican in a very Democratic district and held on for quite a long time. Um, and you know, really understood kind of that idea of being, you know, the elected leader as the entity and did a very um, intentional job at defining who she was, why she was elected member um, and, you know, what her principles were. Um, and she was someone who certainly crossed over into, you know, she voted with the Democrats a significant um, 
uh, percentage of the time. Um, and you know, one of the tools that we we use as well is to help elected leaders think about you know where are they going to be along with their leadership and where might they differentiate themselves. Again, a unique challenge um, for the elected leader. Um, that two-year cycle, or in the case of a House member, or a four-year cycle. Um, is a huge challenge, right? They're always having to think about re-election. Um, former member um, Mike Honda of California, he talks about how you can turn that into an opportunity. Um, it, it forces, if you can use it as a way to connect to your district, um, collect input, and really develop those deeper relationships. Again, that's a great way to manage that challenge and turn it into something that can be really helpful um, and supportive to your leadership. Um, so for the representative, again, a number of different reflection questions that we um, um, that we put forward. You know, how are we thinking about um, about your stakeholders? Um, how are you defining your success? How are you thinking about the roles in your office? Um, and again, that learning plan as well. Um, what do I need to learn to be successful? The next, um, the next path is the appointed path. We call it the proxy, um, and these again are um, political appointees. So you know, secretaries, ambassadors, um, um, many of the different um, um, you know senior council positions in the executive branch, um, and then also um, boards of directors. So people who are appointed. There are a number of different specific criteria, um, you know, for these. Um, for this path. Um, but again, it brings along certain opportunities and challenges, starting with an outside pr perspective. Um, the, the proxy, right, the proxy or the appointed path, they get their power um, through being appointed by a principal and that access to that principal, whether it's the president of the United States or um, you know, a CEO principal who appointed them into the board. Um, those that access is something that um, um, is is a potential opportunity for them. There is a short time frame, which is, as you see, both an opportunity and a challenge. It's an opportunity because there tends to be low expectations around um, around these positions because of the short time frame. Um, but it's also a challenge um, because of the short time frame to make an impact. Um, so, you know, we highlighted um, actually Ron Klain, who at the time had been the former, been um, former chief of staff to then to the former vice president Biden. Um, now he, um, as you all know, is the White House chief of staff. And, you know, he talked about, um, you know, one of the big challenges for the appointed leader is, um, you know, what are the skills that they're bringing in as a temporary position holder? Um, when they are leading staffs of many longtime career professionals in the government. Um, and he came in as a Bolazar, and this is where he was talking about, you know, where he, he really took notice of, um, you know, what, what strengths he could bring um, and how can he could enable um, that success. Um, and so, and, and you know, where were the problems that he could make a difference? And so you see um, this quote that he, where he focused on these problems, what needed to be solved, and how can I help release those bottlenecks, um, but not to you know, get in the way of the subject matter experts, the domain experts, the scientists who, were, who knew much more about Ebola. Um, and he had a very successful run um, managing that, that response. Then you have Sylvia Burwell, who um, has two, she has a number of different positions in her background, but the two that we're highlighting here is as um, former HHS secretary, and now she's president of American University, both appointed positions, right, by terms. Um, and, you know, when she came in as HHS sec as secretary, um, the, you know, health healthcare.gov was not um, working well. And, um, you know, the job of the proxy is really to, you know, reflect the priorities of the principal, right? In her case, President Obama, who had appointed her. Um, and, you know, as you see um, here, you know, really focusing in on um, what are the priorities of that principal and how do you make sure um, that you're addressing those and having an impact in that area. 
So on the development reflections, right, again, um, other things that are really particular to this path around your mandates, your influencers, um, how do you bring value in that limited time frame of the proxy, right? And then, of course, what do you need to learn? The next path is the creator. So these are the founders, the celebrities of our corporations these days. Um, and again, they bring their own opportunities and challenges. So, you know, one of the one of the wonderful advantages is that passion and the vision and that credibility um, that founders bring to their organizations. Um, on the challenges side, right? How do they, what are their own personal limitations in terms of expertise and know-how as that company grows in particular? How do they manage the professional versus personal relationships? And um, also, you know, how do they ensure that they have the necessary financial resources to keep those companies going? The co-founder of um, 2U, which is an online education company, Chip Pacek, he, um, you know, he talks about how these relationships changed over time um, and how he had to manage them, right? Um, he said, you know, that um, the staff who started when it was barely an idea, um, they still treat him very differently than those that, um, that started when he was, um, you know, when it was already a well-established and growing organization. Um, so once again, thinking about how are you gonna grow um, along with the growth of your business. We also profiled Seth Goldman, um, who founded Honest Tea right here in the DC area. Um, and, you know, he, um, he was extremely successful um, in growing Honest Tea, ultimately selling it to Coca Cola. Um, and there, um, you know, how did he think about, you know, his strengths as the company grew and really making sure? to get clear around, um, around how he was gonna build the proper governance structure to share power. Um, one of the big challenges for founders is how do they share their power over time? So again, um, a few different questions for the creator. Right. Um, there's somebody who's not on mute, um, a bit of background noise. Not sure. Thank you. Um, you know, thinking about, you know, who are the people that are going to be accompanying you along the journey as a founder? Um, and then also, how do you think about your own skills and what you might need to become, what might need to be complemented by other members of your leadership team? The last, um, the last path is around, um, is the family business or legacy leader. Um, and, you know, really unique um, opportunities and challenges for this, um, for this path. On the opportunity side, right, how do you leverage the family brand and that family story and that shared commitment across generations? Um, where on the challenges, again, the complexity of these family relationships, um, beliefs about entitlement by the non-family members, right? How do they view the family legacy leader? Um, and then sometimes a limited perspective, but we saw some great strategies by family businesses on how they would require expanding perspective of their, um, of their emerging leaders. So one of the examples that we shared was um, from John Darby, who's CEO of the Beach Company, a real estate company in, in South Carolina. And you know, they have a very strong story about how they used what they call the family DNA, right? The family story. Um, and he shared how his grandfather at 16 years old, you know, would would um would give you a birthday card with your shares of the company. Um, and the stories that were instilled within each of these family members over time, um, not just around the history of the company, but also around its role in the community, which is a huge part of that family brand. Um, and so how do you step into that family brand and, um, you know, use it to give you the proper guidance um, as a leader um, and to, you know, reinforce the kind of culture that your family um, has brought for you. 
But then we also heard about the tremendous challenges of managing um, as a family leader, managing those relationships. Um, and love this quote from Kathy McDevitt um, of the National um, Fulfillment Centers and her, her family business. And she said, you know, when you run a family business, um, compensation and workload are not necessarily aligned. Um, think about how that can affect your relationship relationship with your siblings, right? If one if one family member is doing a lot more work than another, but they are earning the same amount of money. Um, and then also, you know, the competition, that sibling rivalry, when one sibling gets asked to run the business and how that might affect the family dynamic. So again, huge challenges that are unique to that legacy leader. Um, and we provide many strategies for how to more effectively manage um, that challenge. So again, you know, different development reflections in the book. Um, this is just a sampling of them, but really that last one, right? How are you gonna think about your family relationships while you're in that role? Um, and what do you need to develop in yourself to be successful? We have key insights for each of the different paths, but there are a few things that I just wanted to share um, that are critical just as we think about this research. Um, you know, first of all, we did come to that conclusion that not everyone is best suited for every path. And so while the opportunities and the challenges might be consistent, um, how those opportunities and challenges present themselves for different people is an important consideration as you think about which path to pursue. Um, it also became very clear that given how different these paths are, it's necessary for leaders to proactively manage the transitions across the paths. And we have many stories of how leaders were able to effectively do that. Um, as partners, right, HR partners, coaches, and consultants, um, how can you better support leaders by helping to enhance their awareness around some of these different um, path distinctions? Finally, while we think that paths are an essential um, additional piece of the puzzle, um, it's not the only piece. And there is a lot more to leadership effectiveness than simply understanding your path. So that's really a call out to all the other leadership literature that was out there um, that answers so many of those other effectiveness questions so, so well. Um, and then finally, we hope that, you know, as academics, that um, lit leadership literature will um, you know, we'll start thinking about these paths as they um, provide future leadership and management guidance and that they think about these distinctions and that their research takes these paths into consideration. Um, we think that that will make um, future leadership study more relevant um, to leaders across the spectrum that um, you know are critical for you know supporting the these important positions in our society. So as we think about you know the different groups, again, these are all the different groups that would um, benefit from the book, whether it's leaders understanding their own paths better um, and future paths, HR partners who support them, especially on thinking about how are they onboarding different types of leadership paths. Um, and that to not just on, you know, have those onboarding programs for external hires, but to think about other types of onboarding programs um, for the different paths. Executive coaches who can enhance awareness. Um, and we have you know, an entire appendix of tools that are especially helpful for these HR partners and executive coaches. For emerging leaders to again, think about how they wanna incorporate path into their own career pathing questions. And then finally, for the academics um, to add this additional lens and layer to their study. Um, so that's, um, that's our hope. Um, and, you know, we, um, we really did try to um, address the critical concerns for each of these different audiences. We hope that you'll join this conversation. Um, there's a website with more books, six Pass to leadership.com and you can sign up there for um, for more information um, you know as we um, publish more tools and um, um, you know share additional information with our readers um, you know please feel free to link in with me um, and um, to you know follow us on Twitter at six pass to lead um, and um, 
you know, hope that, um, that, you know, we'll hear more from you and how, um, how our research, how our examples are helping you and the leaders you support to be more effective. So we got a few, few questions uh, here. Um, one of them, Chip Palchuk touched on um, in his quote in regards to how um, some of his internal leaders treat him differently as a founder. Did you find um, that theme with some with throughout your research and with some of the other leaders, and um, can can you talk about how that dynamic was both uh, potentially an opportunity as well as a challenge in, in terms of what people shared with you? Um, yeah, so that's you know that is. Um, Again, that is a theme that's going to be different. You know, I love these questions because, again, that's exactly um, there's there's layered in that question is an assumption around the path that we are most familiar with, right? Um, and it might be that founder path, who's where they're kind of considered the celebrity, and they have to think about how they manage it. Um, but then there's also, um, you know when you're internally promoted and, you know, people who maybe didn't treat you as well before, <laughs> and then they treat you really differently. And we have um, a quote from someone who, you know, like people ignored me before and now they're coming up and hugging me in restaurants, right? When I became the CEO. Um, and then, you know, we interviewed a former member of Congress who talked about how, you know, his phone calls were always returned. Um, and now, you know, he bumps into people where, you know, who, um, you know, were begging to meet with him before and then they won't even return his phone calls, right? And so um, I'm not sure if that fully answers your question, but, you know, the point being that, that the assumptions that we maybe make about, you know, what our promotion or what our new leadership position might mean in one path is very different depending on um, you know, which path we, um, we might go down next. And so to, to really explore that um, and to think about, you know, what might you be able to bring from a previous path to a new path? So just the, the last couple here, um, did you, uh, how difficult is it to switch from one path to another in, in sort of your research? Did you see that much and also uh, within your framework of these pathways, how would you categorize someone such as an intellectual leader, for example, uh, chief scientist, for example? Yeah, yeah. Oh, I love it. So I'm going to make the request to, I, I would love some of you to come off a of video, by the way, now that the slides are down. Um, I'm an extrovert and I get energy from seeing your faces. So if any of you are willing to, to take yourself off video, that would be great. Um, so. Okay, so there are a few questions. Um, how difficult is it to move across paths? So that's where, um, you know, we can't say a blanket statement around that, right? Um, what, what we would say, that wasn't, that wasn't an inquiry that we made. What we did um, focus on is with the stories of people who moved across paths, what were some of the things that they needed to do differently because of their path? That's what we were interested in pulling out, right? And I mean, it was so much fun that we, we interviewed the director of the Peace Corps, right? It's great, we have sign off on everybody now so we can talk about you know, all the interviews that we had, director of the Peace Corps. And you know, she had held a number of the different of different paths. And when we were talking with, when we shared with her kind of our theory, she was like, that is so interesting. You're absolutely right. Um, you know, I had never thought about it that way, but it was so different because she was a political appointee, right? This last position was a political appointee and it was a totally different, it was a very different approach that she did have to take, right? And so even though she did it very effectively naturally, we're trying to lift up and say, okay, what did you do differently this time than you had to do previously? And how can we then document that so that the next leader that does something like that is able to read about it ahead of time and be more prepared, right? And so we, we learn from the challenges, the mistakes, the successes from these you know, 65 leaders that we interviewed to help make that transition um, easier. 
Um, the thought leader is a very interesting question. And um, ultimately, you know, we, we required in our definition of leadership that you were a leader of people, right? And so there, there, you know, there is other types of leaders, but that's where, you know, in that first slide, when we talked about the different titles, um, we wanted to make sure that there was that piece of leading people because that's where path is so critical, right? If you're a thought leader, the relevance of path isn't gonna, it's gonna play a very different type of role because so much about the path is how people are accepting of you and are willing to follow you, right? So we're at question. about time. I just want to um, share with people that um, our next month and the events that are coming up here. So uh, let me start this. Just two, two quick slides for everyone. So next month, we do have uh, Rebecca Chianchi. Uh, she's the Assistant Dean for uh, Administration Office at Smeal College of Business at Penn State University. Uh, we should have that information up for you uh, within the next 48 hours. Um, and let's get one next slide, last slide. So your chapter's next events, uh, ATD Eastern Pennsylvania is hosting a webinar with Jimbo Clark, Thinking Outside of the Box. ATD Philadelphia is hosting an event on 520, uh, 520 chapter webinar and scenario-based learning. And ATD Pittsburgh um, is hosting an event on 526 using Excel for basic learning analysis. So we hope you can all join each of those events. We appreciate your support from the chapter level uh, across from Eastern Pennsylvania, Philadelphia, and Pittsburgh. Uh, we thank you for being here. And a special thanks to our presenter, Meredith Priscilla Lamo. Uh, you are welcome at all of our chapters whenever you are in our area. We certainly appreciate your insight. And um, to find your book is both on your website as well as amazon.com, I believe, correct? Thank you. Yeah. Fantastic. Uh, really appreciate so, it. Yeah. We will have the recordings available for you to review, and please do share this with um, your colleagues and other folks you talk to in the chapter. On that note, have a wonderful evening, and thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Meredith. Thank you. Nice thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you from Philadelphia chapter. It was great. Pittsburgh chapter, thank you.